Welcome back to part 2 of this quantum computation series. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, definitely go check that out first since we'll be using what we learned there. Now that everyone's caught up to speed, believe it or not, we're ready to define a quantum programming instruction. A quantum instruction is an operation that takes as input n qubits in some valid superposition of their 2 to the n basic states, meaning the sum of the squares of the amplitudes is 1. The instruction manipulates them to some other valid superposition of those basic states. When extending toggle to work on qubits, a natural definition would be to quote-unquote swap corresponding amplitudes, which will make sense in just a moment. Often a nice way to illustrate this kind of operation can be to paint the corners of an n-dimensional cube with the basic states and their corresponding amplitudes, which works out pretty well in three dimensions of course. In this picture, toggling A corresponds to swapping the corners on the face of the cube where A equals 0 with those where A equals 1. Likewise, toggling B and C correspond to swapping along the other cardinal directions. For the instruction if A equals 1 then toggle B, which we'll abbreviate from now on as if A then toggle B, we essentially do the same thing as a regular toggle B, but only for the corners where A equals 1. Take a moment here to notice that the extensions of toggle and the conditional if then toggle are valid quantum instructions because the sum of the squares of the amplitudes doesn't change if we swap a pair of amplitudes. For more complicated instructions, there's a convenient abstraction that will help our analysis, which is that it turns out to be sufficient to only define what a quantum instruction does to each of the basic states. Anyone familiar with linear algebra might sense a connection here to how we define linear transformations as a matrix whose columns are the transformed versions of the standard basis vectors. For now, I'll just say that this isn't a coincidence. Instead, to decide what happens to input states which are not one of the basic states, there's a very nice analogy to how we think about randomized algorithms. For example, I'll define a 1-bit probabilistic construction called RNG. RNG A will toggle bit A with probability 2 thirds and do nothing with probability 1 third. Let's use this new instruction in an example. We can analyze the following code with the probability tree. First, we create two new bits, A and B, both initialized to 0. Then we deterministically toggle A, which we can represent by a branch of the tree to the state 1, 0 with probability 1. When we do RNG B, the universe splits into two branches, one where B is 0, giving the state 1, 0, and another where B is 1, giving the state 1, 1. The first branch gets a probability of 1 third, and the second gets a probability of 2 thirds. We then have one final deterministic step, which toggles A if B is 1. In the first branch, B is 0, so the state stays at 1, 0. In the second branch, B is 1, so A gets toggled, giving us a state of 0, 1. The key idea here is that if we want to know the probability of certain outcomes, for example that A is 0 and B is 1, then we would multiply the probabilities along the branch of the tree that leads to that outcome. In this case, that works out to be two-thirds. We can actually express the definition of RNG directly in terms of probability trees, one for an input of 0 and another for an input of 1, which is perhaps a more intuitive way to do this kind of analysis. Let's look at a slightly more complicated example. In this example, let's say we want to know the probability that the last bit of the output, c, is 1. To do this, we add together these products of probabilities for each branch that leads to a final state where c is 1. The way that we can analyze quantum code is almost exactly the same. The only difference is that the numbers represent amplitudes, and amplitudes can be negative, which means that when we do the final collation step of adding the results from different branches together, they might interfere and cancel each other out. So far, we've defined two quantum instructions, being toggle A and if A then toggle B, 
which have pretty simple amplitude trees. These two examples have only extended operations that we originally understood in a classical sense to fit the quantum programming model. Because of this, they change amplitudes in a rather trivial way, and on their own don't allow us any more utility than classical computation, and you can see that visually through their amplitude trees since there is no branching. So you may be wondering at this point, how do we actually get non-trivial amplitudes into the picture? And we're ready to do that now. There are many ways to define a non-trivial quantum instruction. I'll propose a one-qubit operation called rotate, which is a reference to the linear algebra I mentioned earlier. I'll define rotate with the following amplitude trees. We should check that rotate is a valid quantum instruction, and that is the case as long as it maps valid quantum states to other valid quantum states. So let's suppose we start with a qubit A in the zero state, and we run some program that gets it to a state with x amplitude on zero and y amplitude on one, and that this is a valid quantum state, meaning x squared plus y squared equals one. Look at what happens with the resulting amplitude tree when we apply rotate. Now we do the final collation step to get the resulting amplitudes on 0 and 1. Let's do some algebra to find the total squared amplitude on this new state. Here we see that the 2 times 0.48xy terms cancel out, which means that after we combine like terms, we end up with x squared plus y squared, which is 1. So, as desired, the output is still a valid quantum state, which means rotate is a valid quantum instruction. I'd like to quickly cover something that would not be a valid quantum instruction, namely assigning a certain state to a qubit. This may seem strange since this kind of operation is ubiquitous in classical programming. But let's see what happens with the amplitude trees if we try to invent an instruction assign 0 that intends to assign the state 0 to a qubit. Watch what happens if we do the same setup as before with rotate, where we get A to some valid quantum state with x amplitude on 0 and y amplitude on 1, and then we do assign 0 A. After a little algebra, we see that the new total squared amplitude is x squared plus y squared plus 2xy. This means if x and y are non-zero, then the new total squared amplitude isn't 1 anymore, so the new state isn't a valid quantum state. Now that we've gotten a feel for how quantum instructions work, I'll introduce another instruction called Hadamard, which has the following amplitude trees. This instruction is named after the French mathematician Jacques Solomon Hadamard. It is central to many real quantum algorithms, and as you may recall from part 1, it's the instruction that will help us to solve mystery toggles. I'll leave it to you this time to check that Hadamard is a valid quantum instruction. Let's try using a few quantum instructions together. Notice how even though the state 0, 1, 1 appears in the amplitude tree, the final amplitude on this state is 0. This is because the two branches where 0, 1, 1 appears have amplitudes which cancel each other out. This cancellation property is what is at the heart of quantum computation. If there's one thing to remember about this video, it's that the ideal goal of a quantum algorithm is to cancel out all of the amplitudes on undesired output states, and to leave all of the amplitude on the desired output state. In reality, sometimes the best we can do doesn't fully live up to this idea, 
but instead achieves a somewhat relaxed condition, which is that some of the undesired output states could still have a little amplitude left over, so we have to rely on high probability of correctness from repeated trials. As a preview, I'll leave you with the mystery toggle's detective code I showed in part 1. We're going to have to wait until next time to dive into how you would come up with such an algorithm. But now that you understand how all of these instructions work, I encourage you to investigate what this code is doing, and to verify that it actually works for any of the 8 possibilities of mystery toggles. In the next video, we'll take a deeper dive into the underlying structure behind all of this, and how we can build upon our knowledge of quantum instructions to understand the algorithm that solves mystery toggles.